discussion workshop 210 called Exploring the Dimensions of Multi-Stakeholderism. We're really pleased to see you all here. Uh, and uh, we're delighted that, you're, that this is a topic of interest. Uh, it's a topic of interest to the panel also. And in fact, multi-stakeholderism has been a, uh, uh, a focal point of this entire uh, uh, IGF, uh, whether it's uh, uh, considered as a means or an end, whether it's uh, to be considered as a religion or not. Uh, or whether, uh, in the words of some people in an earlier panel, whether we are on the verge of uh, going beyond it and going to uh, post-multi-stakeholderism, which is a concept which uh, seems to resonate with a fair number of people. Okay, so uh, the, uh, we, I'm joined by one, two, three panelists who are awake um, and uh, present. This, uh, a, this is an overstatement. <laughs> <laughs> One panelist uh, who is in Nigeria, I think, I'm not sure, but the, uh, uh, he's at the end of, a, of, a, of an internet connection somewhere. Uh, and one panelist who, uh, uh, is, uh, due to lack of sleep, is not here yet, uh, and I hope will be here in order to provide some remarks. Uh, this is a typically formatted IGF panel. Uh, we will uh, have some opening statements by the panelists. Uh, we'll then open the... Uh, the floor to the audience, and since there are so few of you, I'm hoping that we can make the, and since you're obviously interested because you've come, uh, I, I hope that we can uh, start a fairly lively discussion because there are a lot of uh, uh, things about this topic which are um, some, somewhat contentious and certainly capable of generating disparate views from the uh, from people who, uh, who consider it. So, so what is multi-stakeholderism? Uh, it's obviously uh, an, an organizational structure that uh, many people sh uh, believe has great promise for en enhancing the uh, inclusivity in governance and furthering democratic participation. But there's no one fixed model for the, for the multiplicity of uh, possible approaches. Uh, and uh, uh, there are many existing organizations that are either governed by multi-staker approaches or who, whose governance comes sufficiently close to be an object of interest for study. Uh, it has multiple dimensions. In fact, I would argue that, uh, to be more precise, we should, argue, we should define multi-stakeholder model in, a ver in very general terms, and I think that's the uh, universe of dimensions we're going to be exploring today, and regard, uh, for example, uh, organizations who, uh, who state that they are multi-stakeholder uh, as employing instantiations of the multi-stakeholder model and not employing the multi-stakeholder model because uh, that's, that's, that's very, very general. So we want to uh, look at those uh, multiple dimensions and understand advantages, problems, issues, uh, and I think to develop an understanding of the conditions that permit the best exploitation of this approach. Uh, so we're going to uh, uh, look at those dimensions uh, and uh, some relevant questions that, uh, in, and I'm not an expert in this, uh, I think uh, uh, the issue of multi-stakeholderism is one aspect of the possibility, sorry, one, one aspect of, uh, uh, of uh, the issue of governance, how do, uh, does, any, how do any group of, has, how does any group of, uh, uh, or, uh, of uh, individuals uh, decide to, uh, to, self, to organize in order to, be re to show representation to have all voices heard, et cetera, et cetera. And there are many uh, different solutions to that. So some questions. How are stakeholder groups decided upon? Um, how many should there be? Uh, how are their claims to legitimate interest adjudicated? Are there tests that can confirm or question both the adequacy and the composition of stakeholder groups? How does voting interact with multi-stakeholder organizations? And how does one avoid the tyranny of the majority? Uh, are there sets of circumstances that lead to an apparent need to rebalance the stakeholder groups in terms of number, composition, and interest? What are the dynamics of how stakeholder uh, um, groups evolve? And how can this be done in a way that's accepted by the organization before the change is made? Uh, uh, all of these things are, um, uh, are have not yet, I think, been explored because the notion of multi-stakeholder at least based on uh, the use of the term uh, is fairly new. And uh, we don't have enough experience. 
uh, although uh, maybe uh, I could be wrong. These are my personal views and not, uh, not the views of experts in this field. So that's what, this is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to give the uh, floor to uh, the panelists in some order, which I wrote down and don't have yet. Uh, what's the order? You're, you're first. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask the uh, panelists to introduce themselves uh, with a, um, and, and, to re and to restrict the introduction uh, in the spirit of Twitter to 140 characters, and then go on and uh, provide a, an initial set of views uh, which we can use as a basis for further discussion. So, first, Renalia Abdelrahim. Thank you, George. I don't know if I can limit myself to 140 characters. I haven't used Twitter. Not yet, anyway. Sam's trying to convince me. Um, I'm from Malaysia. I am currently a, a member of the ICANN at Large Advisory Committee. In my previous life, I used to lead a global multi-stakeholder network for about eight years. And that network was called the Global Knowledge Partnership. And it gave me a certain insight into multi-stakeholderism and gave me a certain uh, curiosity about what would make a multi-stakeholder entity be viable and sustainable and robust and to deliver the value that it's supposed to deliver. I asked to go first because I'd like to provide a certain context for the discussion today. And I'd like to go slightly higher than the questions that George posed because I think it's quite difficult to compare multi-stakeholder entities and, to draw, and you need to draw some concrete cases, but in order to do that, you have to have the overview. So I'd like to share with you some of the insights that relate to this overview by flagging um, some of the dimensions of multi-stakeholderism that had um, interested me or that I thought was kind of interesting. So first, on the multi-stakeholder approach, George said that it's fairly new it's also not that new. Um, the approach gained legitimacy in the international community as a means to address complex global issues after the end of the Cold War. Some multi-stakeholder entities, such as the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, emerged before the Cold War in 1948. And numerous multi-stakeholder entities emerged since then and focus on a diverse range of issue areas. And I'll give you some examples so you know how wide the use of multi-stakeholder approach has been. Um, in the world um, in terms of sustainable management of natural resources by the Forest Stewardship Council and the Marine Stewardship Council in the field of anti-corruption by the Transparency International in the field of human rights by the Fair Labor Association water management by the Global Water Partnership poverty reduction by the Microcredit Summit Campaign ICT for development by the Global Knowledge Partnership Internet Governance by the Internet Governance Forum and Critical Internet Resources Management by ICANN so those are some examples. In terms of the range of activities that multi-stakeholder entities engage in, there's also a range. Um, some of them focus on being fora for agenda setting, advocacy, and learning, such as the IGF and the GKP. Others focus on standard setting, policy making, such as the World Commissions on DAM or the ISO or the Global Reporting Initiative. There are others focus on certification, like the Forest Stewardship Council. Others focus on mobilizing financing, such as the Global Alliance for um, Vaccine and Immunization, or the Partnership for Disaster Relief after the 2004 tsunami. Others focus on providing services or technical support or building capacity for those who would do it, such as the UNESCO World Economic Forum Partnership for Education. And others just pro provide coordination support, such as Global Water Partnership. And the field, in the field of public administration, they look at collaborative networks that provide goods and services to, to the citizens and, and the public. One interesting aspect of, um, or dimension of multi-stakeholderism is to look at the level of institutionalization of that entity. In a complex environment, a social system would generate a structure that best exploit its environment. Initially, the structure is simple. Later, it becomes more complex. And the level of institutionalization in multi-stakeholder entities generally increases over time and it generally leads to a loss of flexibility. Also in terms of the legal structure of these multi-stakeholder entities, it tends to vary from company limited by guarantee to not-for-profit foundation to international organizations. And these are boundaries that sort of like govern the, in the way that they behave. In terms of actors or stakeholders, stakeholders are essentially those who should participate or those who are impacted. The classical range of stakeholders include 
government, business, civil society, and international or intergovernmental organizations. In reality, the range of actors in these multi-stakeholder approaches or initiatives can be any combination of actors, minimum two or more. And they can be classified as multi-stakeholder, although in the internet field, they insist that it should be the three plus the technical community. So some multi-stakeholder entity adds stakeholders outside of the classically defined range of actors. Typically, the actors in multi-stakeholder entities are organizations or organized groups. Some multi-stakeholder entities recognize individuals while others do not. And then there are the gaps about those who are unrepresented and who would represent them and how would the multi-stakeholder um, entities actually factor for that. That's also one consideration of multi-stakeholderism. Another aspect or dimension is the convener. Who is the convener or the initiator? Depending on context, it could be any one of those actors. In some contexts, the government is the natural or most influential actor, therefore they could convene. In other contexts, it would be the private sector, and in some contexts, it could be the nonprofit entity or even international organization. It is contextual, and usually it veers towards who's the most influence in that issue area. In terms of what principle drives participation, it depends on orientation. Some focus or argue uh, participation on grounds of democracy, where multi-stakeholderism is an end and the participants supposed to be everyone. The other orientation is a problem-solving orientation, where multi-stakeholderism is a means, and participants are those with interests or stakes, knowledge, resources that will help address the problem. Based on my scan of multi-stakeholder initiatives, I, I think most entities are practical and problem-solving oriented. They tend to have membership criteria, and with this me membership criteria comes entitlement, such as rights and privileges, such as voting and access to certain information. Having membership criteria um, does not mean that activities or resources of that entity is not open to non-members. It just means there are some special privileges that are given to members of that community. In terms of equality of actors, we have the president of ICANN who says a multi-equal, multi-stakeholder, whatever. I actually don't think that all actors or stakeholders are equal, and there is evidence to show that they are not equal. Um, for example, let's look at governments. Governments are not always included in multi-stakeholder initiatives or given voting rights, and I'll give you three clusters of examples. The first cluster, where government serves as actors in terms of providing funding only. So they sit back, they think this is an important initiative, the initiative is providing value, so we will support it and we will fund it, such as the Ethical Trading Initiative, the Global Reporting Initiative. And then there's a second cluster where government actors as funders and members. That means they support it financially, but they're also engaging actively as members. That's education for all, forest dialogues. But they're not voting, and they're not in the board. And then there's the third cluster where they are both funders, members, and board members, where they have voting rights. That's the World Water Council, the Global Knowledge Partnership, the Microcredit Summit Campaign, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, and maybe a lot more. And business entities may also be excluded depending on the nature of the issue area. For example, in the International Union for Conservation of Nature, um, they have three categories of memberships. The governmental ones, which include intergovernmental entities. The NGO, non-profit, both national and international NGOs. And then a third category called affiliates, which, are, which comprise the others, such as business entities. So the first two categories have voting rights, but the last one does not. But they do have speaking rights, so they can speak, they can participate, but they cannot vote. Again, the voting issue, it depends on the issue area and the influence and sort of like what you want to achieve and how, what you want to deliver. Am I okay on time? Oh, okay. Um, people also talk about multi-stakeholderism will require equal participation in all stages of policy development. I actually, scholars have actually looked at public policy development and actually see that it's not necessarily overall inclusive. It's broadest at the level of agenda setting where everyone's participation is, is encouraged because that's where you need to understand what the issues are, define the problem, and set certain priorities. And then you move into policy formulation where you try to generate options. That requires more specialized and technical knowledge. And, the, and so the level of participation narrows a little bit. And then at decision making, it's at its most narrow because in certain structures, decision making is delegated through representation. But then after that, there is also implementation where certain stakeholders need to collaborate to implement. So the range of actors increase 
um, beyond decision making and then in monitoring evaluation that's the most neglected part and not a lot of people look at that because that's the part that brings the learning from the policy implementation back into the next cycle of policy development. I'll just stop there because I, and I can bring in the other things later. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. Samantha? Hi, I'm Sam Dickinson. Um, I'm an internet governance analyst and writer. Um, I identify with the technical community, but I actually have a theatre background, so I am very people focused. Um, so what I'll be talking about today is um, actually a, 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 bit, a bit of theory, a bit of theory outside of this internet governance world. Um, what often happens is that we think that the internet is unique, that we have to reinvent the wheel or invent the wheel, but actually a lot of the discussions we're having have been discussed elsewhere and ideas have been tried, worked, not worked. So that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, to begin with, the concept of stakeholderism um, is quite well developed within the, the business world and the idea of corporate social responsibility. It's slightly different because it's about businesses ultimately wanting to make money. But I'm seeing connections because in many of the internet governance um, sectors there are secretariats and they kind of perform the same sort of function as, as a business. They want certain outcomes. They want IP addresses to work well. They want domain names to work well. So they are trying to manage stakeholders, just as a business would in corporate respons social responsibility initiatives. Uh, one of the ways that businesses deal with stakeholders is try to figure out, well, who is a stakeholder? You know, is everyone a stakeholder? Is it just the shareholders? Is it our customers? Is it civil society? So. There are matrices that they can use to evaluate who should we be including in any particular um, process. So some of the, the issues they will look at are things like who is most affected by what we do. Um, in this case, I'm thinking of things like the regional internet registries. Um, in the past, they've often been described as very multi-stakeholder. They are very open. Um, it's probably truer to say that they're open and transparent than multi-stakeholder, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because when you look at something like IP addresses, who is affected? Actually, it's not everyone. Um, they don't affect civil society groups who are interested in human rights, so they may not want to participate. Um, the issue with governments and IP addresses, there are certainly definite issues like... Um, IPv4 markets where governments may be interested from a public policy perspective, but when it comes to should the minimum allocation be a slash 22 or a slash 23, I don't think most governments will care or be affected. Uh, the other issue that businesses in corporate social responsibility look at is who has expertise in this area? So here I'm thinking of things like academia. Academia may not necessarily be directly affected by particular issues, but they may have expertise. Um, who has power? Um, within the internet governance world, governments may have power, large businesses may have power. Who is interested? There may be journalists who are interested in, in issues. Um, so these are the sorts of um, issues that businesses look at when they're trying to manage their stakeholders. So they're possibly things that we can consider a bit more. You know, the, the concept of multi-equal stakeholder doesn't always work. It's, in some cases, we may have to adapt it to different situations, that you are looking for who is the most appropriate, um, at least if you need to get them involved. Um, you may allow and, and encourage everyone to participate, but if you are looking at a, a particular issue and you realise that, hey, this has major implications for civil rights, you may then have to go out and deliberately encourage that sector to participate. Um, within the business context, um, they use those questions to figure out how much they need to um, engage with different stakeholders. Um, so, but business is slightly different because they want to make profit. So, there's limits to how much we can use corporate social responsibility. Um, one of the other issues that's different between the business community and what's happening in internet governance is, well, guess what? It's more political in this area. Uh, if you look at how governments work, when they go to something like the ITU, 
they are acting strategically. They want specific outcomes. What's happening in the internet governance world is there's an attempt to try and reach consensus, to understand. So there is um, a theorist, Habermas, who has this idea of communicative action, which is actually quite interesting for the internet governance world. It's, it's saying that instead of trying to achieve strategic goals, what you do is communicate and try and understand other people's positions and that through understanding you will be able to reach um, shared goals. Um, and, and that's quite relevant. You look at something like ITU and Wicket, there was once again a, a big division between the developed, I'm, I'm being very black and white here, but developed and developing countries in that Wicket who signs, who doesn't sign. A lot of that was to do with people just not understanding the, what the other side wanted. If through things like the IGF, at the moment because there aren't decisions made, people are able to talk freely about their ideas and I think that is helping discussions in other venues. Um, I think the WTPF stuff wouldn't have happened as successfully as it had if there hadn't been more connections made between stakeholders at venues like this. Um, I'm sorry to be so theoretical here, but it, I think it helps to give a higher layer. Um, there was a really interesting workshop on day zero where um, one of the academics described, I'd never heard this before, but I went, it's fantastic, Dunbar's number. The concept is that human beings can only maintain so many relationships um, and that it's somewhere between 100 and 200. On average, you know, 150. That means that if you can maintain 100 contacts, you may have a 1,000 Facebook friends, but in reality, you probably only communicate regularly and know about 150 of those. And it means that if more people come into your life, old friends drop off. So, you know, when you went to school, you had certain friends, but when you grew up, you left them behind and moved on. That has great implications for internet governance because there's 2,000 people at this conference. And if you can only keep connections with 150 people, what does that mean? You know, as more and more people connect to the internet, as more and more people are interested in these topics, we're adding more people, but we have hardware limitations as humans. We can only make connections to a certain number. That's where networks become very valuable in the concept of stakeholder groups because you use those connections to have second and third level connections. And that's where the dynamics and that you can interact with greater numbers. But one of the side effects of networks is that the more connected a network is, the more value it has. So if you are a less connected network, a less connected stakeholder, say from a developing country, um, with very few funds, you haven't been to many of these meetings, you haven't made lots of contacts, you have less social capital that you can use to have an influence in the process. So that is something that we need to remain aware of, that this is... If you are one of the people that comes to these meetings, if you've been to six, seven of these, you are going to have a high level of social capital and a high level of influence in uh, internet governance discussions. Um, but what do you do about those people that have come from a, a developing country who are from civil society, who've got a, a fellowship here, that's great that they're here, but they have low levels of social capital. How do you make sure that their input into the process is valued equally? Um, that's enough theory. I just want to give an example of ICANN as an example of dynamic um, multi-stakeholder, well, stakeholder group formation. ICANN started off, as you were talking about, that when, when organisations start off, there is simplicity. Um, as things get more complex, as more issues um, emerge, complexity results in the structure of organisations. So you look at ICANN, when it first began, it had a domain name su supporting organisation and that covered both um, generic TLDs and CCTLDs. Then the, the CCTLD operators realised that, no, actually we've got kind of different issues to those generics and they split off leaving the generics to become the, the GTLD. They have, within the GTLD, a bunch of different constituencies. 
what's happening right now and is interesting to keep an eye on is with the new GTLD program, there are a lot of what they're calling closed generics. They're not going to be domain names that you and I can get. It's like Coca-Cola, uh, you know, dot Coca-Cola. Only Coca-Cola will have anything under Coca-Cola. So those organisations are thinking of creating a, a stakeholder group within the ICANN um, community. Now, the G the GNSO now has an awful lot of constituencies. It'll be interesting to see how another group interacts. So we're going to see this in the internet governance arena in the next couple of years, how, this, how the questions that we're looking at actually play out. So I, I would just suggest we look at that. Thanks very much, Samantha. Uh, next we have uh, Peter Major. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, you don't mind if I stand up? So I, I'm Peter Major, I'm the Vice Chairman of the Commission on Science and Technology for Development of the United Nations and I am the Chairman of the Working Group on Enhanced Cooperation and I used to be the Chairman of the other Working Group on Improvements to the IGF. Uh, just listening to the presentations here, I, I got frightened. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't realize that I was doing something so complicated and so complex and, uh, and uh, probably I'm a bit too naive. Uh, but more seriously, uh, uh, let, let me start on a kind of personal remark that I, uh, the first IGF I attended it was in 2008 and probably it was the first time I got exposed to what is called multi-stakeholder approach and I just loved it. I was still with the ITU at that time and I came here and I, I just realized that people from all different stakeholders were just talking to each other and uh, exchanging ideas, discussions, and so it was fascinating. Then I joined the uh, Commission of Science and Technology for Development and uh, uh, participated in one of the intersessional meetings in 2010 when the first uh, working group on the improvements of the IGF was created. You don't really want to know the debates and the fights we had. Uh, it, was, it was awful. It was really awful. I, I was really uh, uh, thinking that eventually people start fighting physically. Uh, well, it didn't happen then. Uh, finally, there was some formula which was agreed on that uh, a working group was formed uh, from the uh, different stakeholders. Naturally, uh, governments were represented in the majority. There were about 20 governments, and in addition to the original uh, WISIS uh, organizers, and uh, there were five, five, stake, uh, five, five representatives of uh, the other stakeholder groups. Altogether, uh, the group was created as, uh, uh, as a group of 43 members. So uh, I thought that the worst was over. Uh, as I told you, I'm a bit naive because the worst wasn't over. We had the real meetings. And the first meeting, which was outside Geneva, uh, if I may qualify it, it was even worse than the, the creation of the working group. Uh, it, was, uh, it was in a mutually mistrust. Uh, and uh, we spent, I think, about one day discussing the agenda, what we are going to discuss. And uh, that was the moment when, uh, when people were really about to fight. So, uh, uh, I thought that after the first meeting we can't have a worse one. Well, it was the second one which was even worse. And uh, uh, people just didn't listen to each other. And, and uh, so it, it, was, it was a complete uh, uh, chaotic uh, ending of the whole meeting. I, I, I was a member at that time of, of the uh, Hungary Hungary's delegation, and uh, it was the time when the chair, Mr. Frederick Riel, said that I can have it no more. So he, he resigned, and uh, I took over. 
but probably he did the worst part of the job because he, he, he led the foundation and he, uh, people got so tired of the whole thing that they said, okay, it can't, even, can't get worse, so let's, let's do something. And then from, from the third meeting, we, we really started building up some trust. And I think this is one of the aspects, or if not the most important part, when you are working in a multi-stakeholder environment to, to have trust, that uh, the, the, your con counterpart uh, says what he means, and he means what he says. So, uh, so little by little, uh, from the third meeting on, we, we tried of uh, uh, relaxed and started working, because the working group is uh, about to produce something. So we were committed to, to have some recommendations for for the improvement of the IGF, which is in fact uh, isn't a very difficult thing because uh, everybody agreed that IGF was working fairly well, or to some very well. Uh, anyway, so after three more meetings, uh, we managed to, to have the, the output and uh, people uh, were just happy and they were treated on an equal footing in spite of the original nomination that uh, members of the groups were only called members when they came from the government and the other stakeholders were so-called invitees. So I decided not to make any difference between the, the members of the, of the uh, working group, so I called them participants. And that was it. And everybody was happy with that naming. So uh, that was the first working group. Uh, uh, the second one, uh, it, was, it was a very easy. We created the second one in the very same way about enhanced cooperation. Uh, and it wasn't even questioned that the, it will be a multi-stakeholder working group. It was made uh, on the model of the first one, with the same uh, distribution of the, of the members. And uh, we had our first meeting uh, last May uh, in a relatively relaxed uh, environment and, and we managed to, to uh, produce result in one and a half days, uh, which was a question that some of you may be uh, aware of. And we are going to have a next meeting uh, just after the IGF in the beginning of November. And uh, I hope that we, are, we can work in the same relaxed way uh, to produce some, some recommendations. So in a nutshell, yes, uh, I realize that uh, theoretically it is a very challenging and, and very uh, complex thing. And uh, when I go back, I, I will do my homework and, and start uh, thinking about the theoretical back background. But uh, frankly speaking, when you are on the field and you are doing it, you don't really have time to think about the theoretical background and you have to improvise a lot. So I think I, I stop here and uh, I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you very much, Peter. Interesting dynamics. Uh, we're now going to hear from uh, Jimson Olufe, uh, who is a, a remote participant. Uh, can we get him on the line? Jimson? This is your turn. He's not there. All right. Uh, if, if, if you, I could ask you to monitor. Uh, if he reappears, we'll go on to the next speaker and we'll take him out of order. Then, in that case, uh, uh, the microphone goes to Bill Drake. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Jimson, we can hear you, but barely. Can you can you shout? Talk very loudly, get next to the microphone. Can you can you shout? Talk very loudly, get next to the microphone. The moderator? It's a double echo. Thank you. 
Africa Information and Communication Technology Alliance. Africa Jim uh, Sinnott's not working. Jimson, it's this is not working. Hold on. There, 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 you're coming through, but there are multiple, multiple echoes. I think we're bouncing this signal off the moon several times. Um, so uh, try a, Mr. Technical Moderator, what can we uh, do about this? Let's try to establish, break the connection and try to establish it again, uh, I think, uh, because this, it, it's just not working now. Oh, uh, we can hear parts of the conversation, but not, oh, not enough, and the echo does interfere. Uh, I suggest we, we go on to Bill Drake and we try again after, uh, after Bill is finished. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry I was late. I uh, unfortunately was doing multi-stakeholderism, uh, which made it difficult to be here to talk about it. Um, this has been one of those IGFs where most of the interesting activity is taking place not in the workshops or main sessions, but rather in the hallways uh, and side meetings. And so we are having urgent rushing back and forth meetings of various combinations of stakeholders trying to figure out uh, their positions on some matters, including, of course, the whole Brazil um, ICANN conference process. And it's just been a little bit crazy. So my apologies for showing up late. Um, I happened to walk in during Sam's very interesting discussion of uh, theory um, as an old uh, professor who used to teach Habermas and all these other things. It was heartening to hear those words being spoken in an IGF. It uh, took me back and made me feel, wow, like something that I had spent all those years in graduate school doing wasn't completely irrelevant. So that's good. Um, but then again, I'm not sure how relevant. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I was happy to, uh, to just be turned on to Dunbar's number. Um, that was that was new for me. And I think maybe that that uh, does start to explain something. That's of relevance. Um, I thought I would talk through, George sent around um, some discussion questions that he hoped the group would address. And I thought maybe I would actually do that and um, try addressing the points that he thought were uh, of interest to, to talk about. So I'm just going to offer a few thoughts by way of opening comments, and then we'll have more in the Q&A um, to, to follow up on these points. Um, he asks, for example, how are stakeholder groups decided upon, how many there should be, how are their claims to legitimacy adjudicated, are there tests to um, confirm the adequacy and composition of groups, how do you avoid a tyranny of the majority, and so on. These are interesting questions. Um, I have to say, in my experience, I. Green waters always, they always drip when you open them. I don't know why. Sorry, I just need some water. And it was not an easy transition. Um, my feeling is, unfortunately, the, the longer I've been at this, um, and I was involved in, I guess, what we now call civil society organizations or NGOs, since the early 1990s, um, back in the United States where I come from originally, I live in Switzerland now, um, we use the term public interest groups to refer to groups that were 
doing social advocacy around communications policy. We imagined that we were promoting the public interest um, or how we understood it. Um, and uh, one of the things I've learned in the 20-something years since then is the extent to which um, a lot of these groups' uh, boundaries and definitions ultimately s seem rather arbitrary. Um, there's, there's usually a baseline um, that brings uh, people together into particular clusters, but then once that baseline is established, the boundaries proceed um, to get um, more obscure, particularly as uh, stakeholder groups grow. So, for example, we had a workshop yesterday that George organized on the technical community. And, uh, you know, the technical community at one point you could say was the people who actually did technology. Um, it was the... And we have a wonderful echo going on. That's good. And we have a wonderful echo going on. That's good. It was the. And we have a wonderful echo going on. That's good. Oh, and it repeats. It was the. And we have a wonderful echo going on. That's good. Oh, and it repeats. It was the. And we have a wonderful echo going on. That's good. Oh, and it repeats. It was the. And we have a wonderful echo. It's like a. It's like a mashup. <laughs> That was, that was very nice. So, <laughs> I could have just stopped my remarks there and just <laughs> let them cycle for a while. Like, see if it really, my message really sunk in, you know? Uh, okay, well, I bet the transcript is very interesting at this point. Um, where was I? Oh, so, uh, technical community, when it started where out, you know... You could say was uh, people who actually did code, did engineering, and so on. But then, uh, for example, the technical community became institutionalized within ISOC, uh, and then anybody could join ISOC. So lots of people who were not engineers and computer coders joined ISOC, and they became the technical community. Then we had the creation of ICANN, and ICANN is a multi-stakeholder body, and so civil society and business people come into there who don't do code, who don't do whatever, and yet everybody who's associated with ICANN gets referred to as the technical community, and so on and so forth. And so pretty soon, the terms start to become rather elastic and be used in ways that suit the objectives of particular speakers depending on what the, the immediate goal is. And one can say the same for some of the other groups. Uh, civil society, of course, is the most elastic of all, um, and is highly fragmented into different tribes for reasons that make almost no sense, um, but yet which reflect, I guess, Durham's law, Dawson's law, Dunbar's law. So um, how, how it is that uh, people who have shared um, interests, like let's say you all start out from the perspective of being concerned with consumer protection, or privacy protection, human rights, things like that, can over time splinter into smaller and small sub, smaller subgroups and then begin to focus no, not so much on the things that bind them together, but all the differences. is a fascinating process. Um, I see this all the time. The, the fetishizing of small differences until they become big causes and you get people who just then, you know, have a great deal of time, difficulty collaborating, even though in reality they agree on 80, 85 percent, that 15 percent is just so damn important to them, no compromise can be found, and so then therefore they have to have separate groupings and separate funding if they're in ICANN and everything else. And so we have, for example, in the ICANN environment, this ridiculous situation of having multiple constituencies in the GNSO that purport to speak for the same types of organizations. We have, in addition to that, the whole at-large structure, which includes a lot of the same kinds of people, and indeed many of the members of the constituencies in the GNSO are also in the at-large structures. So you, you wear different hats, you join different tribes, depending on which process you want to affiliate with and so on. Um, and there's tribalism in the business world. 
Um, and again, again, where you could say everybody starts out from the standpoint of, well, we're all in the private sector, we all have an interest. But then anybody, and the people who think that business is united in a singular view are always the people who have no interaction with business. That's, that's the thing that's most striking to me. If I, I, if I talk to some, uh, you know, like Marxist academics, and believe me, they still exist, um, or uh, some of the civil society people that I know who are here with us in, in Bali, they'll say, oh, business, like it's one big undifferentiated category. Anybody who's ever sat through a GNSO council and watched registries and registrars and intellectual property interests and I, ISPs and everything else go at each other and the differences that they have, because there's real money on the table and there's real financial consequences to the differences in positions they're advocating. Again, there's a shared level agree of agreement. Okay, 80%, they favor freer markets, less onerous regulation, not too top-down governmental, blah, blah, blah. But then when it gets down to particular points, whether it's net neutrality or the details of trademark protection or whatever it may be, their differences are just as profound as anybody else's. So you've got all these highly fragmentary, amorphous types of groupings that we use, and we refer to them as if they were these very solid, coherent bodies, and multi-stakeholderism was simply a matter of interfacing between them. But it's, it's not so easy. I mean, as somebody uh, facetiously offered a a definition of multi-stakeholderism, actually inadvertently he didn't realize. I said it was a dis definition of multi-stakeholderism uh, the other day, but I, I think it works. Uh, disorganization on an equal footing. I, th I, I think that's, that captures multi-stakeholderism pretty well. Um, you've got um, a great deal of fragmentation, and then so then what happens? And this comes to George's question about how do you avoid the tyranny of the majority? I turn that around. How do you avoid the tyranny of the mini minority? Because what ends up happening all the time in these groups is that you get uh, what game theorists would call a K-group, a sort of core group that, would, uh, that always is willing to pay the cost of sustaining cooperation within the group by doing the extra work to keep it going, et cetera. And they're the most committed, the most hardcore, the most fervent believers, and so on. And their conceptions of what it is uh, their larger stakeholder group should be advocating tend to predominate and take over. And so pretty soon, you end up with these um, big uh, stakeholder groups um, that say they're for X, but then when you actually look at how their decision-making processes are, are working, it's four or five people who talk the most on a listserv or show up in all of the meetings or whatever it may be who are the most insistent and strident and, uh, and unwilling to bend or change or reconsider their position who end up defining what the group does. Um, and a lot of other people just either it's not worth the hassle to be challenging this all the time, so they just float and say, let it go, or they drift away for a while and they drift back or comes in and comes out, et cetera. So we end up then with a multi-stakeholder process where, you know, we are seeking to do something, <clears throat> as Peter says, very new, very important, very different from a traditional intergovernmental model, very... I think more inherently democratic in some important respects, um, at least with respect to participatory democracy, um, but which is in fact in operation a complete mess. Um, and so much arbitrariness enters into the process. And it's fine when you're doing you know, something relatively non-consequential -consequ like planning the IGF program. Uh, if, you're, if you're in the mag like I am and you have to sit around, and Peter, and you have to sit around with colleagues from other stakeholder groups and fight over the c composition of a main session and whether which person should be the business speaker and whether you need a business speaker for both the industrialized world and the developing world to parallel the fact that there's an industrialized government person and, an, and a developing country government person, so we have to have equity, of course, because there must be strict numbers, et cetera. You spend your time um, fighting over little things like that. They're not too terribly consequential, and you, eventually you can work out some consensus. And then you declare, oh, multi-stakeholder works, uh, Allah. But guess what? Try, try looking at real multi-stakeholder processes where people actually are involved in decision-making that's consequential. We did a workshop the other day, uh, Chuck Gomes is here, that he attended, 
um, on how civil society is represented in the GNSO Council. And um, it didn't quite do everything I had hoped it would do, but <clears throat> I think it did drive home the point, um, if nothing else, that when it actually comes to trying to practice multi-stakeholderism in a decision-making environment, where bargains have to be made, where tr votes have to be traded, where concessions have to be offered from one side to the other side to make a deal stick, where the trading of concessions happens not only on just an individual issue, but across multiple issues and multiple time frames. Um, it starts to look, number one, more and more like the way governments work, <laughs> sadly to say. Uh, but number two, uh, it, you realize that the, the geometry of organizing multi-stakeholderism and making it actually effective is unbelievably complex. In the, in the GNSO Council of, of ICANN, where, where we nominally make um, policy pertaining to generic top-level domains, and I say nominally because increasingly that's more of a GAC and a board decision, um, but um, what happens there is often, um, you know, you, you have these totally fluid kinds of alignments where people are exchanging concessions and the alignments are changing constantly. So on one vote, I, I'm the chair of the non-commercial users constituency, on uh, one vote we find ourselves aligning with the registries against the registrars or against the inter intellectual property interests, but then on the next vote we're voting with the intellectual property interests against the registries. Um, and we're all balancing trying to find the thing that's the closest to our ideal of what's supposed to be in the collective interest. But of course, this means as well that maintaining stable trust-based relationships is very difficult because the, sec you, the whole notion of building up social capital presumes a certain amount of iterative exchange of concessions, getting to know each other, the shadow of the future, you establish a reputation as a cooperative partner and your partner knows that in the future you'll do what you say because you did in the past so they can trust you even in situations of ambiguity and so on. But it's very difficult to build up social capital when you're constantly forced to change your alignments and one minute you're voting with somebody and the next minute you're not. And so trust doesn't really get institutionalized in, in the situations where multi-stakeholderism has to actually do decision making. And you end up instead with um, everybody focusing on the differences. So I, I think I've talked more than enough. I only did one of your questions, George. Um, but my point is uh, to say that this ain't easy. Um, you know, there's a lot of happy talk about multi-stakeholderism. We, and the multi-stakeholder model is if it was a singular thing um, that we should all genuflect to. But the reality is that the actual conduct of multi-stakeholderism the constitution and conduct of it is extraordinarily complex, unduly divisive, and often dysfunctional. Um, and that we manage to muddle through, stumble forward, pick your metaphor, um, and maintain a system of internet governance through this approach that is better than the alternative is quite remarkable. When you think about it, maybe it speaks to how bad the alternatives really are. If, if you. If you could do something this poorly and have it be superior, <laughs> you're in quite a business. So anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, I think tangentially you've helped to explain the total dysfunction of the U.S. Congress. <laughs> uh, apparently we have a possibility of getting back to uh, Jimson in uh, Nigeria. Is that correct? How, how, how are we doing? Can't do it. Okay, so you're going to read the text uh, from Jimson. Okay, uh, well, that's the best we can do. We're going to do it. Okay, my name is Jimson Olivier, is the CEO Contemporary, an IT consultancy firm based in Abuja, Nigeria, and chair. EFICTA, Africa Information and Communication Technology Alliance. I was formerly the president of the Information Technology 
Industry Association of Ni Nigeria, ITAN, 2007 until 2011, and Vice, Vice Chair Africa World Information Technology and Service Alliance, WITSA, 2010 until 2012. Like Peter Major, my first IGF was in 2008, and I loved the process that takes into account my opinion. By the way, Peter Major handled WG on IGF improve, improvement very professionally. I had the privilege of serving in the United Nations Commission for, for Science and Technology, CSTD, for development working group on IGF improvement 2011 until 2012 and was recently appointed as one of the five global business representatives into the UNCSTD WG on exchange cooperation. Peter is still Peter is still doing a great job as chair in the WG. I'm very pleased that tough I could not be there physically. Yeah, through technology, I'm with you because what matters most in deepening stakeholders' participation in IG is to ensure the stakeholders' voice are here. In this regard, I like to thank the host government and all concerned for rising up to the occasion to make IGF 2013 a, a reality. There is three keywords here. First is exploring, second is dimension, and third is multi-stakeholders. Exploring potents deep vertical and horizontal check of the extent, cardinality, size of or scope of the multi-stakeholder model. Basically, on the scope, we can say that there are five stakeholder groups in the multi-stakeholders discussed on IG. They are government, business, civil society, technical community, and the academia. The question to us this are, first, are they on equal footing on the IG multi-stakeholders? Second, is equal footing required to expand the benefits of internet as an engine for growth? And the third, in the face of NSA, and other nations' activity, which are often denied, can there really be a balance of role on IG, or has the bridge collapsed? How democratic, transparent, and account accountable are the stakeholders themselves in their internal process within business itself? To what extent are the stakeholders carried along as we have the large business organization? that could afford to hire policy staff to medium and small business that cannot afford to hire such pol policy staff but could pull interest in an association or an alliance like Evicta. It is not longer in up to multi-stakeholders as a management principle is a game ch changer in internet governance. It has helped in the G gigantic gains recorded on internet expansion and acceptance in recent years. More than a third of the world population in on the internet by extension, multi-stakeholderization is increasingly permitting global management discourse. As we experience this evolution to what extent and can be this be bought. As we experience this evolution, to what extent can this be balanced is a major question. Balancing multi-stakeholders in a phase of increasing government assertive control is critical. Can anyone predict the end result of this evolution and the end of the text? I'm sorry for misspelling. Jimson, thank you very much. If you can hear us, uh, uh, I'm, I'm delighted that we were at least able to get your statement, uh, if not talk to you uh, directly. So uh, so here we are. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five uh, 
really thought-provoking and uh, very different presentations about a variety of issues related to multi-stakeholderism. Uh, we've gone a lot longer with speakers than, uh, uh, than the normal IGF panel. On the other hand, the quality and the, uh, uh, the interest, I think, in the subject uh, uh, really has re uh, rewarded us by, by letting the speakers uh, uh, speak for a fairly long time. Now, we have, uh, we have about 20, 25 minutes left. Uh, there are at least two people in the audience who probably have very firm opinions about some of the things that have been said. There may in fact be six or seven of you, I just don't know all of you. Uh, and I, I think w let's first give you a chance to say whatever you want to say, uh, responding to good, responding to uh, uh, speakers, raising points that you think are, are relevant, uh, and uh, uh, perhaps stressing, uh, although given Bill's comment about the uh, what is it, the fetishism of small differences. Uh, uh, I was going to say stressing uh, differences of opinion with what the speakers have, have said or agreeing with them, doesn't matter. So I have two, first the gentleman here, then Kathy. Um, Ian Fish, BCS, the Chartered Institute for IT in UK. Um, I was going to just give an opinion of somebody who's only, only been to three IGFs. This is my third. I started in Nairobi, and this is my third. And uh, I was beginning to think there was some sort of law of increasing cynicism uh, over multi-stakeholderism, which is why I actually came to this, this thing, because normally I go to other, other things. I don't go to the ones that are related to multi-stakeholderism. So I was delighted, actually, by what Bill said, because uh, it's... Uh, and the conclusion that it's better than anything else because uh, it reflected a lot of what I found. But um, the things that really occurred to me over the over the three the three years that I've been are the sort of self selection thing, which I think you referred to, where in effect the panels that I've seen have been the same people saying roughly the same things uh, with slight differences, either advances or retreats, depending. Uh, uh, over the three years, so there's that there's that problem that, that I think I think comes into it. The second major problem I noticed is that it's fairly obvious. I mean, your, your point about business and business being very differentiated. I've I've come across that in other fields in the past, but the problem that I see is things like SMEs. Now, I think that the IGF makes a wonderful effort to bring in SMEs from the from the place where they are. And there are always lots of them there. There were lots in Nigeria, lots in uh, Azerbaijan, and lots here as well. And that is f fantastic. But they, and they then listen to them when they ask questions in the uh, in the panels. But in in both Nigeria and here, less so in Baku, but in uh, Nairobi and here, I've noticed the tendency of the moderator to get another question immediately afterwards and answer that one instead. And that's happened at least once here. In, a, in one that I've been in, and at least twice in Nigeria, uh, because the questions were not quite in the way that the panelists or the moderator was expecting the, the session to go. That's I've seen as a problem. Um, and that's really all I want to say, but I do reiterate that I do think, I like you, I love this, uh, this way of working because you get to see and hear and talk to people that you wouldn't otherwise normally. I come from a technical stroke civil society background. So. Thank you. Kathy Hanley Aaron. Uh, earlier this week I was in some uh, in some workshop and <laughs> there was a discussion about multi stakeholderism. Go figure. And um, one of the panelists made a comment that I've been thinking about since then that multi-stakeholderism has taken on, has almost been elevated to that of a religion. It has become a value, not a practice. Um, and as with most values, people are, um, you're, you're either in or you're out. There's there's no in between, and I'd be curious for the panel's um, view on that. Yes. Um, who would like to respond to that? Okay. 
Uh, well, thank you for this question. And uh, basically, uh, uh, that was my feeling as well. And uh, it has been kind of confirmed by the strong theoretical background, uh, which probably I don't have. I, I just do it. And uh, this is my philosophy. You do it. And uh, it's not because it's a religion, but uh, but still you can believe in it. Go ahead. Uh, I'll roll. Real quick. Um, you can't use it. Thank you. I didn't actually put it the right way. Do do you think some of the fanatic? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, do you think that has affected? Do you think that has affected really getting our arms around and making multi-stakeholderism work better? That was profound. Yeah, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, sorry, Peter, were you here? How are we going to do this? I'll, I'll start with this one right here, the one. Hi, I'll answer with some theory. <laughs> um, there's an interesting article, and it dates back a while ago, but there was a, a an experiment back just after World War II where they got 24 boys that were of equal backgrounds, equal academic performance, nothing that you could really tell any, anything apart. They took them to a camp and said they were on a, a youth camp, but what they were actually doing was they split them into two groups. There was no difference between the two groups, they just split them. The mere fact that they split them into two groups meant that those two groups started forming their own identities in opposition to the other one. And I think that's what's kind of been happening with this multi-stakeholder versus intergovernmental situation. So what you've got is intergovernmental versus multi-stakeholder. And multi-stakeholderism is defining itself against intergovernmental rather than trying to find ways to improve it within the situations. And you can see that in the US government with this whole shutdown thing. It, you know, I mean, really, there's not that much difference. Um, but once you start putting a line between two groups, differences start becoming concrete. If you have more groups, it often um, dis disperses that binary opposition. So in Australia, just to give an Australian example of practical, we have, it's less powerful now, but a third party, a third small party. Um, they don't get many votes, but they get enough votes to go into parliament and their motto has been keeping the bastards honest. Um, and the concept is by having someone else in there, having more points of view, it allows everyone to stop seeing themselves as rivals and start communicating more. Well, I think in, in the context of multi-stakeholder uh, approach, uh, you have to have uh, relatively strict rules uh, to, to kind of uh, have the, the uh, borderlines for, for the work of the group I'm talking about. So you have to have an agenda, you have to have a kind of uh, uh, respect for, for the mandate if you have one, and it's preferable to have a mandate to, to focus on, on the real issues and uh, preferably to go on uh, consensual decisions. Now, if you have uh, relatively strict rules, probably this fragmentation of the group uh, within the stakeholders or among the stakeholders uh, kind of uh, diminishes. Uh, that's my experience. And uh, basically, uh, if uh, you 
treat all the uh, members as I do in, in, in the group on an equal footing, then it even lowers the tension. So probably uh, that's what I found that, uh, that can be extremely useful to, to move forward. Thanks, Peter. I'd like to make a couple of remarks. I think there, there's a quote. I think it's Winston Churchill who said it. Uh, democracy is the worst form of uh, government except for all the others. And that's the kind of thing one might repurpose to say that multi-stakeholderism is the worst form of getting, uh, of, of making decisions and, except for all the others. Uh, that's, uh, I think uh, uh, you have uh, identified a, a trend, a very strong trend in this IGF of skepticism uh, I would say, rather than cynicism, of uh, the multi-stakeholder uh, model uh, being uh, a, an object of uh, worship. Uh, it started in, w in the civil society discussions last weekend, and it has permeated some of the uh, workshops that have occurred. I think this is healthy. I, I think it indicates a, a maturation of the way in which we look at what we do or who we think we are or how we're organized, and I'm, I'm really pleased to see it. And in some sense, uh, that is uh, uh, why the, the notion of post-multi-stakeholderism is, is appealing, because it says there's something beyond this we, uh, that we need to understand uh, and, uh, and perhaps migrate to in some way. There's al also been, uh, I think, a um, not uh, explicitly so much a sense of multi-stakeholderism as a means and an end, and I think we confuse them very often. If we think uh, they are an end, uh, then we ought to be discussing uh, them in, the, in a political science context. If we think they're a means, then I think there are two things uh, we, we ought to be doing. One, we ought to understand the tool, because it is a tool. And the other is we ought to spend more time on the ends and look at the, uh, the larger tool set to decide which of the tools are best equipped to help us solve our problems and reach our goals. So, um, Chuck. You want to respond? To, okay. He wants to respond. You want to respond. Who wants to respond? Okay. And then Chuck. Oh, Bill. Okay. I'm confused. Hi. Um, just on the point of the same people, you said you see the same people all the time. Um, I can tell you on the MAG, it's, it's actually quite difficult to do this because it's hard to bring in new people, and particularly people from developing countries that we, that somebody knows and can say, yes, on that event about such and such, you're talking about... Uh, spam or cryptography or whatever, I've got the perfect person, he, f he or she fits in well, and I know they have the funding and they're coming to the meeting. Anytime we have that in the mag, we go, ooh, fantastic, and we try and invite them. On the, uh, this year, you might have noticed um, there are a lot fewer mag people on the main sessions. In fact, there are none. Those of us in civil society, we stayed out completely. We, we, I, in the past, have moderated the Critical Internet Resources um, session a couple of times. Um, and, and we made a decision that uh, we want to get new voices, new faces. And so we weren't going to, even though the easy thing to do when you're trying to plan something, particularly under a difficult time frames and you're looking around and you're saying, who can we find who can do this that we know will handle it? And the easy instinct is to say, oh, you know, the colleague that I work with all the time, we know she's an expert on this, she can do it. We said, no, we're gonna try and get new people in. And, and so that's what we did this time. But then even have, if, after having done that, it turned out that because with the delays with the approval of the finalization of the host country agreement, and we didn't know if the meeting was really gonna happen until rather late, and a number of people canceled their travel plans, et cetera, we ended up having to pick from an expanded circle of usual suspects. So even though we didn't put bank people on, we put on other people you see before. Um, and I think the same kind of dynamic happens in workshops as well. So it is a challenge because obviously what we want to happen in the IGF is to surface and bring to the fore new voices as much as possible. But who's gonna fund their participation? Is their participation going to be notified to us in a way that 
we would be able to do something with? How do we judge whether there's the expertise to put them on a main session or whatever? It all gets very complicated, so it's unfortunate. Everybody is frustrated, just so you know. Everybody involved in planning the IGF is frustrated with this aspect of it. We all would like it to be lots of new people, lots of new voices, and it's just really hard to make it happen. Okay, two people haven't been heard yet. And I have to, have to uh, in the interests of having every voice heard, we start with Chuck and go to Manal. Uh, thanks, George. And I want to start off by thanking the panel because I think you've uh, shared a lot of things that are, are worth really thinking about. Uh, before I, I get to the points I was going to talk about, uh, I want to react to a couple statements that were made. Uh, uh, I, I'm puzzled by the mul post multi stakeholderism thing, George. Uh, uh, I, I hope we don't try and give up on the multi stakeholder model too quickly uh, uh, because I, I, I really believe there's some real value there. Uh, I don't think it's a goal in itself but it's a means uh, to achieving the goals that we do have. Uh, and, and when we move away from that, I think we're heading in a danger zone. Uh, I understand, like, like Bill pointed out very well, it's very complex and we get frustrated and we want the easier way. The multi-stakeholder way, like Bill said, is not the easy way. Uh, uh, and then just one more comment, uh, Samantha, you, you uh, pointed out that sometimes the differences aren't that substantial. I would just qualify that with saying sometimes they are really substantial. And that's when the uh, multi-stakeholder process, and in particular decision-making in the multi-stakeholder process, uh, becomes uh, very difficult and challenging, and yet one that I think we could con should continue to strive uh, uh, to make better. Now, back to your presentations. Uh, I, I was uh, I, I noticed some commonalities ac across some of the things you said. W one of the things that caught my attention, both Renalia and uh, Samantha, basically said, you know, hey, multi stakeholderism is not new, and and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And all the examples you gave on uh, on where it's been used, tremendous resource there. Uh, it would make for a great academic study to wh wh where are the commonalities, where are the differences. Uh, and I think it illustrates, too, that there's not one size fits all for multi-stakeholderism. Okay? Each situation is different, and we certainly find that out in the GNSO. Some of our working groups you know, have worked just fine. Some of them have been terribly challenging, but they're all different, and the participants are different, and that's okay as long as you give opportunity to all the people who are impacted and all the interested parties and so forth. And, and the, in the end, you let the whole community look at it. That, that's okay. Uh, I, I like, we're not, only, what you, not all actors are equal. I, I think that's true. We try to assume, and, and frankly, I'm not one of those that's fond of, of uh, Fadi's uh, multi-equal stakeholder thing because I think it's an oxymoron. That I don't know what it means. Uh, how, how can everybody e be equal? <laughs> Thanks, Bill. <laughs> that may be. Uh, so... Uh, E equality in itself is only an issue if we're voting. <laughs> and so, uh, and there may be, there are times I think when it's helpful to take a poll or do some things, but if we can try to reach consensus or at least a, a level of an agreement that all of us will support without voting, in other words, without determining the power that everybody has, I think we can better take advantage of the uh, multi-stakeholder multi process, although that's, that's not easy. Uh, the, I, I, I won't go into it. I like the, the concept of social cap capital that several of you talked on, and of course the, the common element of trust that, that, that a couple of you talked about. Uh, Bill said, how do you avoid the tyranny of the minority? And I think that comes... Yeah, one way we can do that, I think, is with good leadership. But is that the only answer? Probably not. But but uh, the what's that? Uh, then we have a problem that we need to deal with, right? 
leadership needs to function in a, in a neutral way. And if they don't, I think we need to change it. But anyway, that, that sounds easy, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. You and I have both been there. Uh, uh, and, and, and coming back to the decision-making, uh, w- when there are consequential decisions, that's the hard part of multi-stakeholderism. And it's going to be hard. And uh, the only alternative to the time and complexity is to... Uh, change and not do multi-stakeholderism and then do some sort of a tap, top-down approach, which I think is, is a terrible mistake. Uh, it is complex and more complex the more complex the, the differences are, and we do have real differences in our global uh, environment. Thanks. Thanks again for the, for the things you've shared. I, it's, it's got me thinking about quite a few things. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, allow me first also to. Uh, my name is Manal Ismail. I work for the Egyptian National Regulator and I represent Egypt at the GAC of ICANN. Uh, first of all, I want to thank also all the panelists. It's, it's been very informative personally to me uh, with the, the theoretical background of multi stakeholderism, the examples and the practice of it all was very informative. Um, of course, it's been so clear how complex the the, the multi-stakeholderism is, but I think it's it's more of um, like a growing tree. Um, we cannot continue that flat. I think we need to promote the 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 model and the approach to have it on different levels, um, and and make sure it's being implemented nationally, regionally, and then at at a higher level, and then it becomes a matter of representation. But uh, without this uh, approach and model being adopted at, at, at the different levels, I think it's going to be even more and more complex. So we just need to make sure that the tree is growing down and it's growing in the right way and we're lending a hand to... Um, countries or stakeholders who are underdeveloped to make sure that everyone is included, but again, not at a flat level, but rather at a well-represented uh, approach of uh, or structured approach. Thank you. Uh, we are uh, theoretically out of time. We started a little late, so uh, every panel member gets about four tweets worth of, uh, of time. And uh, Jimson has, uh, has sent something in. Why don't uh, we read this first, and then we'll go down the row, and then we'll end the session. This has been a really interesting session, and it probably should be a, a semester course. Uh, responding to the statements or question from the floor, here is my feedback. As business, I had a very good feel when I for the first time sat on the same table with government on the same subject matter as the United Nations, which is an exclusive club of governments. So multi-stakeholderism is a reflection of what is on ground concerning players in the internet ecosystem. Business in particular drive a significant working spectrum of the working of the internet. As SM, SME, we value that our voice can be heard and it needs to be continually heard here. If multi stakeholderism provides a space for my continuous participation, I'm happy with that. On funding, people make a mistake of thinking business will business will always fund the process. Let me say again there is a large business and small business. While large business might not have problems find funding events like this, small business in developing nation will think twice because of the need to prioritize how they spend their income when the issue of they when the issue of daily sustenance issue are there. Policy 
issue is usually not a priority. However, Dove coming into association, they are able to pull resources together, but they is tough to organize for a reason of priority. I agree with the speaker from the floor that the multi-stakeholder model is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Jimson. Okay, Peter. Well, uh, for me, it was very useful because uh, uh, the uh, lack of uh, theoretical knowledge uh, has been provided to me. So uh, probably I, I will I will make use of it in my next meetings, and uh, uh, hopefully I can be up to the expectations. Peter, I was a practitioner before I started looking at theory, four years at the national level and then eight internationally, so you're, you're not doing too bad. Um, Bill thought, mentioned something about muddling through, and he said it sort of somewhat negatively, saying that, oh, we have to muddle through. But public policy generally is done through muddling through, so we're not in bad company with multi-stakeholderism. Um, Chuck mentioned about leadership as something that can navigate this towards perhaps a, a goal and sometimes it doesn't work. I think in addition to the leader, you have to appoint someone who's a facilitator who can spot gaps because the leader sometimes may be directed and may have specific stakes that he, he or she may not control. Um, Multi-stakeholderism is supposed to have a value proposition. It is not an end. It's, the end is actually a secondary value. The first value is actually the what you can achieve together. I remember trying making the case for the Malaysian government to adopt the multi-stakeholder model, and this was during the Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad's time, to, to for them to go beyond public-private partnership. And it is the first value proposition is that here is a problem, a complex environment that we're going into with ICT and the information society, and, and here is a mechanism in which we can deal with this and we can seize it as an opportunity as well. The inclusion of it is a bonus. And so that's why I also believe, as you do, Chuck, that it is a means. It can also be an end, but that's secondary. Thank you. Um, this is just looking overall at... We tend to look at criticism of the multi-stakeholder model in its various forms as something bad. That it, that it It's bad. Um, but like general project management in the world, things are iterative. You add, if you're running a project, you should, as best practice at the end of it, conduct a lessons learned exercise. And that's kind of what we're doing in real time with multi-stakeholderism. We need those voices that dissent. Um, if we don't have voices criticising, we don't have a way to correlate whether what we're doing is good. If we have no voices of criticism, we're probably doing something really, really wrong. Um, I'm not cynical about multi-stakeholderism. I just... Uh, I, I see challenges, and um, it's a constant process of creation and learning and recalibration, and if you can't have some dark humor about it, then you're dead. Um, I mean, we're living through this thing. We're trying to make something as we go on the fly, and a lot of times stuff is being made up, and... A lot of times, uh, you know, rules don't get followed, procedures turn out to be elastic, categories quibble, um, quiver and don't maintain their uh, character, and, and all these things are natural. Um, but it is something that's worth preserving. I remember when it wasn't accepted at all. I remember in WISIS phase one, Governments throwing us out of the room. I remember how we had to fight to get recognition to be... We literally had to pound on the door. I mean, I really remember this. Um, we literally were locked out, and we're standing in the ITU in the hallway, pounding on the door, asking to be brought back in. Um, I remember uh, multiple times throughout that process where our legitimacy, our right to be there, was challenged directly. Um, and I remember how different things were after we did the working group in internet governance and showed that a peer-to-peer -peer level co collaboration where people actually had to persuade each other based on knowledge and information and, I, and facts um, could really sway 
uh, someone's thinking, and things shifted from there. So, I mean, I think we have this cherished thing that we've built through hard labor, and we have to keep working on it. But if you can't laugh at how goofy it gets sometimes, then, uh, you know, you're, you're going to be very brittle as you go through the day. I think we've used this time well. And I thank everybody for good contri and interesting contributions to an inter a good discussion and a worthwhile discussion. Let's give ourselves a hand for that.